Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I'm pretty happy about that. <laughs> I know it's stunk, but hopefully this time will be good.
speculative fiction about California in 2024. And so it takes place in this like post-apocalyptic California landscape as people are walking from Los Angeles to Humboldt County. And, um, and I think about it a lot just in terms of um, uh, just the clear, the clarity with, um, that the author is thinking about it. And the clarity is, is sort of about climate change and wealth gaps and, um, and scary changing times. Um, but I find it a deeply human and hopeful book um, that is, uh, and I recommend, I highly recommend it. I, I thought it would be like eating vegetables. All the smartest people I knew told me to read it. Um, and I avoided it because I thought it would be hard. Uh, but it, it's very entertaining. <laughs> um, so uh, all of the, the work in this show is really an ode to and a reaction to California, a place that I grew up. I grew up in Oakland and a place that I live now. I now live in Los Angeles. Um, I think of California as a place where decadence and disaster are sort of right up on top of each other and sort of kissing all the time. And that's sort of the way that the work um, operates as well. Um, I'm going to talk about the arc of my work since I left grad school in Boston and um, to move to California, which was around 2014, 2015. And uh, there's a really good showing of that work in this exhibition. So a little bit before that, I want to start with the work that I was making right out of grad school. Um, I had a profound time in Boston. Um, it was the first time I left my hometown and my work was changing a lot um, materially. I had worked with watercolors, but I found a type of work with this plastic paper that I use that took all the sketching out of it. I, I before had been very um, controlled and I would do a bunch of sketches and I would make um, I would make five different versions of the sketches, and then I would make a value study, and um, and then I would blow it up and put it on paper and, and, and transfer it. And when I started working this way, um, I just was doing everything right on the page. And so what happened is I started making things that were a little scarier and a little more embarrassing and stuff that maybe if I had five or six times to sketch it, I would have been like, that's weird. That's a weird thing. I don't want to paint that. That, that feels weird. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so th this work was really mining sort of my past and my adolescence and the intense friendships I had with other young women. Um, and it, like I said, it all kind of came like, it was like back off and it came like puking out of me in this way, which is a really special moment for an artist to have where the work is just like kind of coming out of you and can't stop. But I, I, I had a lot of backed up things that I wanted to sort of talk about. Um, um, I was reckoning with the inherent dangers of being a young woman in the city. And it was really a love letter to how beautiful and brave and vulnerable me and my friends were at the time. Um, I was using these hyena motifs to talk about predators and scavengers, and um, the hyenas were pretty much sort of like a metaphor about my relationship to and fear of men. Um, over time, it kind of became about playing with some of the more nuanced ideas of being both preyed upon, but also really internalizing a lot of the misogyny and often making really hurtful choices to other women. And so things kind of changed. So the hyenas at first were like, oh yeah, it's these bad things that are out in the world. And over time, the hyenas were like, oh, it's me. It's, it's sort of, and it became a much sort of darker and more nuanced um, discussion. Um, that these scavengers were sort of part of my psyche as well. And one defining element of these paintings was that they existed in this white void, right? This is watercolor. All the white you're seeing is um, the paper. So the white you're seeing, um, there's no place, there's no stage. It kind of was existing as a memory, as a void, um, and 
and there was no sense of place. It all was sort of happening in my mind and in my memory. Um, when I moved back to California, about three things were happening at once. Um, the, one of the things that was happening was I watched, um, was my grandfather had a stroke and um, died. And I was there and I got to watch it. This is the other shoe, this is the oldest painting in Scab Picker and it's from 2016. And one thing that really struck me watching my grandfather, watching my grandmother lose my grandmother was watching something that had given her so much strength, something that had propped up this person and made her so strong when it was taken away, sort of the vulnerability and the void that it left. And so I found myself thinking a lot about the ways that we lean so far into someone else that we sort of, that the boundaries between one person and another person get kind of mixed up. And it was sort of beautiful, but it was also a little um, jarring to watch, um, to watch something so strong suddenly, so to watch my grandmother who was so strong become so vulnerable. Um, and I started thinking about the other places where like the boundaries are kind of get a little bit mixed up, you know, between one person and another. And I started working around ideas around sisters and sort of again, I'm sort of materially playing with this idea of, oh, I don't know where, where your sentence ends and my sentence starts. Um, and twins, again, these are uh, two of my best friends in high school who are twins. Um, and again, sort of this idea of like, oh, is it one person? Is it this two-headed person? Um, and again, thinking about where, where are other places where the boundaries between people really begin to get um, dissipate, right? And so sex and ideas around intimacy. Um, and I really started thinking about this push and pull of intimacy, this sort of give and take, and um, ideas about losing yourself into each other, um, which sort of ended up um, functioning as a way of like sort of intimacy with the land. So the second thing that happened when I moved back to California um, was I was really intensely struck by the landscape. It was 2014, 2015, there was like a drought that had taken, you know, that we were in the middle of a huge, huge drought. And coming from Boston, I was just struck by how intensely dry everything was. Um, this piece is called Drought Tolerance, it's from 2017. And you can sort of see some of the elements of the work that I was doing. There's, um, there's um, this idea about the intimacy of friendships. These two young women are peeing together in a field of flowers. Um, but I'm also, <laughs> um, I'm thinking about finite resources, right? To, to live in California, you sort of think about water, you think about the, the brownness, the, the, the lack of green. Um, and I'm also getting older and I'm thinking a lot about energetic resources, right? I'm thinking about this idea of having finite resources, thinking about my grandfather's death as a finite resource, thinking about how much energy I have as a finite resource. And that's all sort of getting mixed up together. Um, there is a deep feeling, for me at least, when I was in, um, when I was in California, I just sort of be like, what's supposed to survive here? Especially in LA, it's a desert. It's like, it doesn't feel like people are supposed to be here, and yet they are. Um, so I sort of think about that. This is like a very small sketch of what ended up being that very large painting, which is Scat Picker. This is the title painting of the show. Um, and again, it's sort of, um, I think of this painting as this idea of kind of, leaning into the discomfort of being here and sort of getting comfortable with that discomfort, right? So there's the discomfort of, um, of, um, of existing, there's the discomfort of sort of, and sort of like the toughness and the vulnerability of being sort of um, vulnerable against the cactus. And then there's the discomfort of, um, of uh, showing this work to my family. So the third thing that happened as I was 
moving back to California was I really became obsessed with this oil field on Route 46. My husband's family is from Salinas, and I was driving back and forth from Salinas to, um, to LA. And there, uh, along Route 46, right outside of Bakersfield, is this oil field, and it goes on for so long. It's oh, maybe that, uh, maybe that, that video might be video. Um, uh, how do we get it? Just press play. more videos, but we're going to skip them. So, uh, but you get the idea that sort of this, um, it felt like, it felt like, I'll, one thing was I grew up in California and I'd never seen, I'd never seen so many, so many oil fields. So it felt like sort of a secret that I didn't know about. The other thing is that they reminded me of like an apocalyptic fairground or like dinosaurs or dinosaur sized like dipping birds, those things that Japanese restaurants. And I was just, really visually and aesthetically like kind of obsessed with them and I didn't totally know why but um but I began to really kind of play around um with these elements and I started mixing and matching and trying to figure out what the work means the work that I was making um the hyena work I was really clear it was like work that it I knew exactly what I was doing, right? I was making stuff and I was like, the hyenas are men and this is a memory I have or whatever. And this work was very much like, I don't know. I don't know why, I don't know why I can't get these oil fields out of my head. I don't know why I'm thinking about them in terms of all of these other things. And I started, um, I started really thinking about this idea of finite resources. Right? And that all of this stuff sort of felt like, oh, this is about the push and pull. This is about the things that give us strength, whether it's oil, whether it's our housing, any of that stuff is it's finite. And it also, it's got a cost, right? And sort of thinking about these costs and these limits of intimacy. Um, this is Crumbs in the Bed, it's from 2015. Um, and again, I'm starting to think about um, you know things that give us comfort, and you know, I've still got the hyenas in there. Um, these paintings are starting to get increasingly elaborate, um, and the other thing that's happening is that they're really existing in a place, right? So instead of the void, these paintings are beginning with um, with with a, what I would call like a stage, and then the rest of the painting is coming um, is coming afterwards, and so these paintings. Are, um, the time frame is getting much, much larger. I was talking to some people in the gallery. This is the beginning of, um, of Shoot Out the Sun, right? And so this is a good example of it starting with just this oil field on top. And it sat that way. And I didn't know what the rest of the painting was gonna be. For a while, I thought this was going to be the painting. Um, and, um, and it sat in my studio for months like that. And then slowly over time, the tent city came, and then the whale came, and then the figures busting out of the whale came, and then in 2019, the excavator came. So this painting actually showed in two or three different, it showed like this, it showed like that, it showed like this. So again, there's like sort of this sort of slow burn of allowing it to kind of reveal itself instead of knowing exactly what it's about. Um, and, and sort of having faith that if I'm interested in something aesthetically or if I'm interested in something that it will really start to make sense. Um, this is also around the time when, um, when, the, when the tent cities and the homeless encampments begin um, uh, entering. And again, it's sort of this idea of 
who gets to survive here? Like what gets to survive and what, what, what goes in the process? What doesn't survive in that process? Um, let's see. Um, also over time, it doesn't, it's not just oil fields, it's pretty much anything I see on the five in between Oakland <laughs> and LA. So there's cement plants, there's roller coasters, there's uh, Altamont. Um, this, uh, this piece is where I needed was more, but the idea is like they, 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 these places exist in a place and they're a reaction. They're sort of, so much of my work is like, this is what it feels like to be here. Um, one little side story about this piece is that I had maybe the best reaction I've ever had to my art ever at uh, a stranger at a party uh, asked what I did and I told her I was a painter and she did that thing where she was like, oh, let me look at your work right in front of you. And so she pulled out her phone and she was looking at it and she looked at this painting and she looked at me and she was like, oh, I get it. This is like when I was a teenager, 30 days after my best friend killed themselves, I lost my virginity because I wanted to feel tethered to the world. And I was like, oh! <laughs> yeah, 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 that's, that's it. Or, I mean, maybe I just shouldn't have been friends with her. But, um, but it was, again, like to have somebody see that or feel that. Um, I also once had an um, oil executive look at the work and just say, well, in my in my field, you're either fucking someone or getting fucked. And I'm like, oh my god, did the oil executive just write my artist statement? <laughs> they might have. Um, I'm, no. uh, over time, uh, fires begin to make their way into the work. This piece is um, this piece is called the day the sky turned red. It's a reference to September 2020 in the Bay Area when the fires um, made the sky turn red. And um, again, during the pandemic, I had a lot of, I was already making this work and I had a lot of people call me and they're like, I feel like I'm living inside of your painting. <laughs> and I felt so bad because um, what a bummer, right? <laughs> uh, and the fires are sort of continuing here. Um, this is what we whispered and what we screamed. It's from 2021. Um, this is from a Joan Didion quote, the title. I, the way I title things is like I, I take things from songs. I have like a long Google document of, um, of words I like and quotes and mostly song lyrics. Um, but this is a Joan Didion quote that says, um, I think we're well advised to keep on nodding terms with the people we used to be whether we find them attractive company or not. Otherwise, they turn up unannounced and surprise us, come hammering on the mine store at 4 a.m. of a bad night and demand to know who deserted them, who betrayed them, who is going to make amends. We forget all too soon the things we thought we could not, never forget. We forget the loves and the betrayals alike, forget what we whispered and what we screamed, forget who we were. And I, just kind of felt right. I love this idea of this forgetting being its own destruction, right? And sort of, again, so much of my work, I think, is sort of about cycles and about, about destruction and cycles and rebirth and cycles. And so I really loved this quote. And also, when I'm doing a talk at a school, a Joan Didion quote makes me feel really smart. Um, <laughs> this piece and a couple of the other pieces were all done at the Quinn Emanuel residency, which is a residency I did at the end of 2021 um, in a uh, law office, in a working in a working lawyer's office. They gave me this corner studio, um, and working in downtown LA. Um, <laughs> this is a very funny picture in New York Times reporter too. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that just sort of gives a sense of what it was like because everybody was sort of still masked. It was sort of intense. It was, um, part of the reason why the law office was doing it was because um, uh, they had all this office space, right? So this is a corner office. They had all this office space and the lawyers weren't coming in anymore and so they were trying to figure out something else to do with it. But um, driving into downtown LA every day, um, Again, there was, I've got some footage, but the video was so complicated, I think I'm gonna skip it. But uh, I'll explain, there's this video 
video of um, just there's a woman cleaning. That's my view from outside the window, and it starts with somebody cleaning, cleaning the windows, and there's a fire in the background, and there's people swimming, and there's people swimming at all these uh, luxury hotels, and um, it really sort of codified this idea that I already had of like us living in our luxury hotels, sort of watching everything burn. I'm not going to play it um, because I think it'll um, be destructive in its own way. Um, the other thing that was happening was there was so much building happening. This, this building here was mid-building, and I was there. I was in this residency for four months. It didn't get touched. It was just all work had stopped on it. Um, and other places, there were just cranes everywhere, right? Just so much building, and as I was driving in, I was driving through so many people living underneath the freeways, and so it was sort of like these two things were sort of exponentially growing, right? The, 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 the tent cities and these buildings, and I kept on thinking about the ways that, um, the ways that they were never, that no one in those tent cities was ever gonna live in any of these buildings, and these buildings were gonna sit for so long waiting for people to be able to afford them. And it just sort of felt, again, like this, this sort of never-ending cycle a little bit. Um, let's see. Also, another thing that happened while I was working here, well, two things happened here. One, they were like, this is a working law office. You can't have nudity. Um, and the work got sadder, weirdly. I didn't know. But like they, they didn't want nudity, which is very fair, because it was a law office. Um, so, there was no nudity, and I didn't really realize that some of the sex in the paintings were like functioning as human contact and hope. Um, but it sort of was because I found the work that I made here to be a little bit more austere and colder, and maybe even more of a bummer than um, than my regular work. Personally, <laughs> uh, like a full bummer. Um, oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. This is an interesting piece also because it, um, this is a piece that kind of demanded to be bigger. That's something that's been happening. You can see in the corner, in the left-hand corner, the original one, and then it needed to get bigger, and then it needed to get bigger, and, um, and no matter how big I made it, this is the one that's not showing, but it was even bigger, but it's, it's, no matter how big I made it, I was like, I think it needs to be bigger still, and it's sort of this never-ending, um, this never-ending uh, search. That happened with um, Forever This Time, which is in the show. It started out about 24 by 36, and um, I made it to the size that we all saw in the gallery. Um, and as soon as I made it, I was like, I think it needs to be twice as big, because the figures are getting smaller and smaller. Um, and it's just one of those. It's also um, got so much salt on it. This is, uh, I use watercolor, and a very classic technique in watercolor is you throw salt on it, and it makes pretty designs, and salt dries up, uh, it takes up the liquid. Um, and I'm really kind of pushing how much salt, how much, like, it, it, I don't know if anyone can see or if the light shows, but this one almost sparkles because there's so much salt on it all over. Um, this is sort of a sister painting that was in the show that I just did in Tac 16 in LA. Um, it's called I'm Gonna Make Noise When I Go Down. And both of these paintings are kind of pushing into abstraction a little bit, and it's the way that I'm comfortable with, which I'm like, well, there's still, there's still people, they're just really small. Um, <laughs> but a thing that happens sometimes with, with artists and that I find happening is that things are becoming more and more abstract as as I'm getting older. Not because I'm like losing my vision, just because <laughs> I'm getting bored. Um, and I sort of think of that as having a relationship with this piece, which is, again, sort of these pieces, it, there's no white space, right? So I started with all this white space in the void, and these, these pieces are really getting pulled out, they're getting excavated out, and they're really, um, this is just a, uh, one of the things that um, people have started sending me carcasses, if they see carcasses on the ground, and a collector of mine just found this sheep, dog, we don't know, and sent me a picture, and I uh, spent a lot of time making this for uh, the show that I'm at 
the group show at Brent Corpo Bali that I'm in right now. Um, this is my favorite wall, I think, at the show that I just did, and I'm just showing it because, um, I don't remember if I said this already, but whereas some of the other pieces, like uh, Shoot Out the Sun with like the oil rigs and the whale, and I'm like Eddie, like everything kind of like live together. Um, one thing that's starting to happen is I'm sort of letting each piece contextualize itself, um, or like letting each piece talk to each other, but there's only one thing going on. It also made me realize um, this piece is called When Smoke Changes the Color of the Sky. And um, one of the things I realized is I sort of, um, and this piece is called, uh, what is the piece called? Um, uh, the Old Familiar Sting. And so what I do is I, I found that I want to paint about wildfires in a way that's sort of intimate and emotional. And I want to talk about wildfires or climate change in this like intimate, emotional way. And I sort of want to talk about sex like a natural disaster or something and sort of mix out with titling kind of like what all of that stuff means. Um, this is called Make It Rain. Um, and it was done during the heat wave last year. And again, these ones were done very quickly. You know, it's water, so it just dries right with everything. Um, and again, sort of in terms of top titling, this one is called Gobble Me, Swallow Me. Um, it's from a song called Walk, which I will not uh, say more about. But, um, but again, I like that mix. I like the mix. It's, it's, a, it's a Cardi B song. And sort of like this idea of it sort of contextualizing it as sort of sexual and aggressive and also um, sort, of, um, sort of overtaking in the way that kind of fire does. Um, I was talking to somebody else. Uh, this piece, um, Hand in Unlovable Hand, we're almost done. This piece, Hand in Unlovable Hand, um, uh, is again another wildfire. Um, we tried to put this piece in the show, and it just um, it doesn't it doesn't play well with others in a room. It needs its own wall. Um, but again, there's this idea of watching, right? There's this idea of spectacle. There's this idea of what. In this case, this guy is jerking off in front of a wildfire. <laughs> one thing that um, one thing that's sort of important in my work is no one is ever panicking. People are either doing nothing or having sex or just watching, you know, and there's sort of something, um, like I never, I, I think that there's something about just sort of um, living with something and sort of uh, the cognitive dissonance that I feel every day when I'm like, I'm just gonna walk down the street and I don't know if that person is uh, dead or sleeping on the street, and but I should get coffee, um, again, uh, this is a this is a bunch of people uh, jerking off in front of a whale, <laughs> as one does, um, because there's a spectacle about it, right? I mean, there's something, there's something, and that's also sort of. I mean, I think of that also as, a, you know, to an extent, I feel like that's a self-portrait in terms of like I'm just watching it. I'm just. I feel often like I am witnessing the world burning and uh, doing nothing. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, this one is called Slowly First and All at Once. Um, and it speaks, for me at least, um, more. I haven't really talked that much about materials, but um, I like this one. Among other things, obviously, there's a scrap metal plant, there's a dead whale, there's there's rot, as I like, but um, most like uh, the 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 pile of junk took weeks and weeks and weeks to paint, and I was in a funk, and I sort of hated it all the way through, and the whale came in an hour, and so I sort of love this idea of you know like some of these paintings take three years, and some of them oh this is a scrap metal plant and it's an inspired by. Uh, that's right across from my studio. Mm -hmm. So this idea that like some of them take so long, this was done in a day, you know, and um, and I really wanted this piece.
piece to be life-sized. I wanted it to feel like the same size and sort of unavoidable um, and um, felt like an urgency to make it really big and sometimes that urgency allows it to be very big. Um, this is, uh, I am still right here. And again, we're ending with this whale carcass um, and just sort of this beautiful spectacle. Um, I was talking to somebody in the gallery just about the sadness of it, but also, you know, all these other things get to live, you know, like bugs and <laughs> maggots or whatever else is feeding off of it. And there's something that I find really fascinating about, about those cycles and sort of beautiful about the, uh, the brutality and um, decay of those cycles a little bit. Um, yeah, so I think I covered every piece in the show. Um, that's it, I think. We've got, uh, thank you so much for, for being here, and I think we're going to... I could, 
I think I don't I think I don't think I could do it with the ones with the salt because I think um, but the the older ones the smoother ones I could take rubbing alcohol and take off that varnish and go back in there if I wanted. Yeah. Thank you. Noticed a lot. You have your paint dripping in a lot of your uh, work. What is what kind of draws you to do that? It seems like it's like drooping. <laughs> it seems like it's what? it's like drooping by do that having that effect by doing that with a lot of your paintings. It's yeah. really interesting. Um, I, I I make these big foam core uh, uh, sort of surfaces that I take the paper to, and that's so that sometimes I can work flat, and then when I want to, I can lift it up and let it drip. Um, and I like, I like that the drips give it gravity. Sometimes if I paint something and it's still wet, I'll just put it up and just let it drip and either it will be gone or it will be cooler. Um, so it just sort of depends um, with some of them. Um, it's just a way to kind of get a sense of movement. It's a way, I am naturally, I have like an illustration background and I'm naturally somebody who really likes to fuss and have things perfect. And so um, sort of taking it a little bit out of my control, like letting it drip down or something will often take away some of that fussiness. And if I'm lucky, it will leave the essence of a thing. And if I'm unlucky, then it's uh, time to paint some more. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
definitely sort of the, the big purple piece that was there, um, and a little bit even the blue piece with the birds, sort of these, these um, ones that are a little bit more monochromatic and a little bit leaning towards sort of the saltier, more abstract feels like the direction I'm going a little bit, but I don't have, I don't have like a, like, all right, gotta get back in there, but, um, but I bet it'll be, um, that'll be a bummer. <laughs>
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it was great talking yeah, to you. Yeah, I hope you have a good rest of your day.